My name is John Goodwin, and I was makeup and makeup effects, and you're listening to the Movie Raid Show. It's time for the Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is special effects artist as well as makeup effects artist John Goodwin that has done John Carpenter's The Thing, Men in Black, and many, many others. Hello. Hello. How are you? I've got to say one thing really quickly. I got a nice credit on Men in Black. I didn't do that much. It makes up for some of the credits that you don't get where you've done a lot on, on things, but they were very nice and gave me a credit. I actually was, you know, did some second unit stuff on that, but it didn't amount to much. I just wanted to make that clear. I don't want to anybody to think that I was, you know, doing a, working with Rick Baker and doing a lot of effects on it. I had to do some stuff, but I was brought in by the other makeup person on the show. So I've explained my magnificence there. <laughs> but uh, it's funny about credits, I got to say, you know, some of the most difficult things you do in motion pictures and television, you may not get credit for. And then other times your name is up there and you go, oh my gosh, oh, oh gee, I'm surprised I didn't do that much. There's another one called Critters. I helped out because they were behind and overnight somebody gave me emergency call and I made some molds for them overnight, stayed up all night, made some molds for them. And the next day when they came to pick them up, I said, I was joking. They said, well, John, thanks for doing this. And I said, yo, well, make sure I get credit, but I was joking. And they gave me credit on the, on the film. <laughs> you never know. You just never know. Is there anything that you're, you're currently working on that we could check out right now or anything that you re recently did do that had, they came out that we could, we could check out right now that you'd like to promote real quick or anything that, that you'd like to yes, add with I, that? I would. I'd like to promote. I, since I, I'm actually retired, my wife, who's a costumer, and I retired a couple of years ago, and I have a short film of my own, and I think genre fans will enjoy it quite a bit. It's called The Man in the Green Suit. premise is it's the last day of a guy who's playing Gorgadon. Uh, he's the guy in the suit, and they're about to fire him to go digital. That's the big thing right now. All these years, I've wanted to write screenplays, and I have two screenplays now, which the writing class I'm in, they, they like them. It's the result of years and years and years of picking up scripts and reading them and going, oh my God, what is this? And so now I'm putting myself on the task to come up with better scripts than the ones that I, sometimes I had to work on in another way. I've got a good Sherlock Holmes, and I've got a Jules Verne novel that's never been adapted to the screen, which I think has great potential. That's what I'm working on. Aside from working with other successful films, or became successful films over the course of the years, when does an artist feel established, or do you think that it's it's more of the opportunity? Like, for example, the, the, the time that you did work on John Carpenter's The Thing, it was a different time, and it was a different era as far as filmmaking, as far as the special effects and makeup department. That was much different compared to now. Was that the moment where you feel established then? Compared, was that during the course of your the years that you worked on? Well, it's a difficult question, really. I don't know. First of all, artists, no matter what you're into, whether you're a painter or whether you're a sculptor or you work in movies or whatever, you you come up with something that people like that's a hit. But you're still always on the you know the hot seat because even if you've got a hit. Now you've got to duplicate it. Now you set the standard and now you have to reach it again. Or you have to do something different to still be a success. The artist never really gets to rest that much, no matter what your art is. It's like the sports heroes, I guess, in a way. Everything's a new game. You may have won a game last week, but you're worried about winning the game this week, you know. Starting out with the thing, I... I was, we were talking before, I got my days in, which is not uh, difficult to explain, but it has to do with becoming a union person. Uh, local 706 is a makeup artist and a hairstylist. Local, I got my days in so I could take the exam and become a member. And I got those days on the thing originally. So it's special to me in that regard, but uh, there would never be another movie like it to work on. It just was set up in a different way and it had a lot of freedom. It had a lot of respect for the makeup and makeup effects that were uh, you know, hired for the pictures. That was, um, in a way, a high point starting out at the top. But I don't know. I worked on um, Poltergeist, too, with Craig Reardon a little bit, enough to really uh, understand, you know, what they were up against on that picture. That was fun. I think probably the person I'd like to mention, his name was Mike McCracken. Mike McCracken was 
easily, in my opinion, uh, the finest artist that I ever worked with in the industry. He was a sculptor before he ever got into movies and television, and uh, he taught art and whatever. I mean, I've worked with some wonderful artists, but I think Mike could do things effortlessly. He had just been sculpting all those years. His mentor, I think, uh, Chris Mueller, the sculptor who did the creature from the Black Lagoon and stuff like that. And, and Mike wound up gaffing pictures, and I worked a lot with Mike in, at his shop, and I can't praise the guy too much. I mention him because, you know, some of the others are bigger names, and he kind of got lost in the shuffle. He certainly did a lot of work for the larger companies and never got credit for it before he started to get credits as well. Working with Mike was a thrill. I hit back and forth between television and features. I was always the person that uh, did a television show that lasted for like 13 episodes. You know, some people out of the gate, they get a show like a MASH or something that runs 20 years, and you never have to look for a job. But I was always doing the television shows that never lasted, although some of them had some interesting things, you know, you got involved with. So back and forth between features. And then finally, I was asked to do CSI when it started out. And I didn't know at the time whether I wanted to do it, but it seemed like a really good opportunity. I'm glad I did it. After that was done, the feature thing kind of dries up when you're, you know, you keep your contacts going. If you work uh, 10 years on a television show, by the time you get back in the mainstream, you know, nobody remembers who you are. Uh, not that television isn't a mainstream, but long-term employment sometimes cuts you out of probably more than anybody. I worked everywhere. I worked at Disney's. I worked Universal a lot. I worked at all the labs or shops at one time or another. It was fun because you didn't get tired of doing stuff. Uh, a lot of times you wind up on a long-run show and, you know, you're doing the same things. I mean, CSI got a little bit like that for me because you're just doing Y sections on people and you're doing the same kinds of stuff. Although usually they would come up with something and you'd read the script and you'd drop it. You're going, oh, I never even heard it. What are they talking about? And you'd have to get out the encyclopedias of medicine and the whole thing and get into it. So it was pretty challenging. You were achieving different levels of crafting, but in today's business, do some of the qualities of the artist uh, in terms of skill, can they only be limited to certain a degree in, in certain areas or do, do you think there, there's something more to that in terms of achieving these kind of levels of the craft? Let's talk uh, digital for a sec because that's really widespread and there are a lot of people involved in it. But digital is like anything else. There's good and bad digital. There are different degrees. But at the same time, the industry and the business aspect kind of shapes a lot of the choices that are made artistically. One of the things which I think they're overdoing doing digital. I think uh, they're abandoning practical effects too much. One of the reasons they're doing it has nothing to do with the artistic nature of either our art form. It has to do with business, and it's a post-production effect. A lot of filmmakers or the producers like it as a post-production effect because what they, the big money, they say, is not rolling when you're doing post-production effects like it is when you're doing practical effects. I suppose that's true to a degree, but, you know, I think you can't make an entire film, you can't make all the choices in one effect or another. I think Ray Harryhausen was the best one to put that into words. He said, if you don't keep varying how you're doing an effect, they're going to catch on to it. And I think an awful lot of the digital world, I don't know what they are, but they're not movies to me. <laughs> They seem like a kind of a cartoon, somewhere in between a cartoon and a, and a movie. But I think the problem here is they're overusing one effect. It's a great thing. I mean, you know, you're changing somebody into a wolf man and, and you, you can't come up with a state. You know, they shoot something and they don't have a cutaway. So they, you can come back after you put an appliance step on and you can do this computer generated image to take you over that little step. I, I think that stuff is great. But when you, you say, okay, we're not going to do any makeup, we're just going to have the guy sit there and we'll do it digitally he'll turn into a digital werewolf and i don't know i don't know it becomes a little obvious it's different it doesn't have the dramatic potential the full dra uh, dramatic uh, potential there may be other uh, other aspects but i take it down to the performance level a friend of mine bob burns when he got into his gorilla suit bob burns is gone he was tracy the gorilla and tracy the gorilla uh, or anybody in a monster suit even the creature from the black lagoon still has an actor a performer there now it's different it's not for all performers but there is performance going on and when you're doing 
doing stop motion animation, Ray Harryhausen or Jim Danford or those guys, they actually are the actors. They're performing that puppet. They're deciding how it moves in their mind and what this uh, Cyclops creature would do, whatever. They're, they're doing performance. When you're doing CGI at this point in time, maybe in the future it will get more sophisticated with the people or the artists that are doing it, but we're not really getting the performance. I started out as an actor and had a brief career as an actor, but people that believe that something is just the sum of its parts, and there are people that believe that when you know everything is on, you get something larger than the sum of its parts, and I believe that's true. I think when the performer is in there acting, whether you know whether there's anybody in a dinosaur suit or not, something happens. And it comes across. And, and we've lost that. We've lost that on a lot of these films. There were people that specialized in that. So I think performance gets definitely slighted with the uh, computer-generated effects. You know, during an artist's career, like where do you think the, where the foundation and the, the structure is, is really like a solid structure where, where it's really built? Is it when they get the recognition or it, does it not really exist in terms of when it's actually having a solid foundation with that? Or is it really just about how much recognition and so forth uh, in between. You bring up something, and, and it sounds like I'm, I'm straying from the point at first, but I'm not. In movies and television, the first thing they told me at film school was you are in an art form that is a unit of many, many different crafts, arts, and skills put together. And that's true. When you're in the workaday world, you don't really have that much control. Say the artist who's painting a picture or someone who's writing a novel and can do it the exactly the way they want. You are working with other artists, and essentially it's different every time. You'll pick up a script, and the writer tells you exactly what they think they want. So you're limited. Even if you read it and you think, oh no, it'd be much better if we did it another way, you're going to have to deal with that. can't do it by yourself. So the work situation that you wind up in is determined by a lot of factors that you have no control over. Now the ones that I think most people like the best in makeup or makeup effects or any of the departments are where they go, well, listen, I'm hiring you. You know what you're doing. You go do it. Those are fun because you get more control. And in a way, you can be prouder of your effect because it has come from you. You're not trying to realize somebody else's vision. But most of the time, movies and television, even if you get some say-so, it's 50-50 or 30-70 or whatever it is. You never really are control of the art form. That's why a lot of people in movies and television or whatever, they sculpt things on the side or, or they paint pictures on the side. And now I'm making short films on the side. It's more rewarding in its entirety. But I think probably the artist in movies and television, like I said, they like it when they're, they're given a free reign. And of course, you have to have some kind of a reputation by then, or you have to have the trust of the other filmmakers involved. But you know, most people don't understand, like for instance, a television show, it's not just the writer and the director and the producers. I mean, you're in competition with the other artists on the show. Special effects may want to do something a certain way, you're going, no, no, that's a makeup effect. Or props want to go, well, no, that's an over-the-head mask, we'll just get one of those. No, no, it should move with the actor. This is makeup effect, let me do an impression, let me do a sculpture and make you one that, with the works that fits. You're not just you know, looking at a script and going, well, this is the way I interpret that. That. It never stops. Every day that you're dealing with any other person in a motion picture situation or a television situation, you're kind of trying to, say, sell your talent to do a particular function the way you think it should be done. And it's always like that. It never lets up. Now, a lot of times, see, in, in television and in long-running shows or in movies, directors and actors and writers, they like to work together. They'll try and they'll do two or three movies together, whatever. At least classic Hollywood was that way. And that's because they get into a kind of working relationship and they know what they're responsible for without even being asked. A film producer that will use the same composer, they go, okay, now go do your thing. Or they're going, now make it a little bit like the one that you did 
did such and such. It can be very frustrating to some artists to get into movies and television. I enjoyed it because you meet a lot of people that you probably wouldn't interact with that are not pleasant, but it's always made up for by the people that you do meet that are wonderful artists and are wonderful to work with. It has both aspects, but a lot of people are not really geared for it because they don't understand that you're not going to be able to say, okay, now makeup effects, I want to do this, this, and this. It may happen, it may not happen, or it may happen a little bit, but you never know. That's my advice to anybody who wants to get in movies and television. You have to be aware you're working with at least 100 other people to, for the end product. Creativity themselves as an artist sometimes, even though they do enjoy doing this, do you think their own creativity gets a little bit taken away too? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, when somebody tells you, no, that's not what we want, you think you've got something terrific, and you probably do. Yeah, it, it takes its toll. There are two types of people that get into movies and television. There are people that loved movies, the people that loved movies since they were five years old, and they wanted to get into do something in the movies. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people. And the other kind of people are people that it's a job. And they're probably very good at their job and sometimes do wonderfully artistic work, but they got into it because their family's into it or they lived in California or somebody said, uh, you know, audition for that part and they got it. Both kinds of people can come up with wonderful work. But I think there are, basically, you can divide the people working in the industry into those two groups. I mean, I gave up a lot of other choices, if I do say so, to work in movies. I mean, I had a geology teacher in, in college that wanted me to go into geology out of the blue. He's going, you know what you're, you're talking about? And I said, oh, no, I'm in the cinema department. I, I got to do that. And he goes, well, good luck. <laughs> you know. So, yeah, there are two types of people that work in the industry, but doesn't, you can't evaluate the, the, the finished product from the type of person, really what you put into it. I mean, I know a, a greens guy I started out as a greens man and became a makeup artist, and he was a wonderful makeup artist. He didn't even know he had a talent for it until he was thrown into the movie world, and then suddenly he's watching the makeup artists and what they're doing, and he got into it, and he was great at it. Sometimes it's a latent talent you don't even know. I'm a little upset. I think a lot of us are, no matter how we work in movies uh, and television, or what we do in movies and television, by the amount of remakes, too. You know, you can only feed off the animal for so long without raising a new one. Personally, I think these huge franchises, the ones that they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, can get a little tired after a while, and they'll come out with a big sequel to one of these things, and they'll be totally surprised that it's a terrible failure at the box office. You've got to keep creating those things, and uh, most all the large franchises that we look at today started out as Dark Horse Candidate. I mean, look at Star Trek, the series on television. They, they kept fighting to bring it back. Star Wars was, you know, a Dark Horse Candidate, you know. I think when it first came out, people didn't know what to make of it, you know, the, the people that are the money people behind it. I'm a prophet of doom on these huge franchises because they're not really starting any new ones. you got to take some chances. You never get anything good unless you take a chance. Sometimes you fail, but unless you're taking a chance, if you're too confident, you're not going to get anything worthwhile. So this has been my John Goodwin at the art school lecture. <laughs> Go and plug in any websites or anything that we could check out now or anything else you care to add with that. Well, no, just look for the man in the green suit. And thank you very much. The Movie Raid Show, obviously, even if you're just getting a snippet now and then, knows what they're doing. And I want you to continue to listen. A little commercial announcement there, but definitely warranted. There you have it, everybody. That is special effects artist as well as makeup effects artist John Goodwin.